From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and during our first half hour today, a visit with K-State's Romulo Lulato about planting a new alfalfa stand this spring. He'll share information on the new low lignin and glyphosate tolerant alfalfa varieties, how well they've performed in independent field trials, and he'll look as well at nutrient management for newly seeded alfalfa. Later, Britton Rucker talks with K-State's Sandy Johnson about a relatively new approach to diagnosing pregnancies in beef, cows, and heifers, that is, conducting a glycoprotein test to determine pregnancy. She spoke on this topic at the recent K-State Cattlemen's Day. And further ahead with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas, K-State's Gus Vanderhoek. All that here on Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Tuned in to Agriculture Today from the campus of Kansas State University. Welcome once again as we'll center on alfalfa production in Kansas and what to think about if you are in fact establishing an alfalfa stand this spring. Romulo Lolato is with us. As you know, he is a wheat production specialist here at K-State, but he also doubles as a forage specialist with K-State Research and Extension. So we've invited Romulo in to talk over a couple of things here, alfalfa variety selection and fertility management. But Romulo, one thing we can say with some certainty, if one is going to plant alfalfa this spring, they'll be planting to moisture. <laughs> Hi, Eric. Yes, definitely. I mean, if we can ever get around <laughs> planting, right? Right. <laughs> so thanks for having me here today. And variety selection and fertility management of, on alfalfa. I guess two important topics that a uh, producer who either is going to establish a stand now or has a already established stand uh, is probably thinking about, mm -hmm. right? So going into this uh, first topic of variety selection. I think whenever we're establishing a, a stand of alfalfa, we need to keep in mind that this is a four, five, six years or more commitment, okay. right? So I'll definitely encourage producers to really do their research as far as the available options on alfalfa for their region with, with good adaptability, right? So before making that commitment, what are some important traits that we need to keep in mind when selecting our alfalfa variety? Uh, first, of course, is the yield potential. Right? Are we talking about a uh, five ton per season? Or are we talking about an eight ton per season? Now, historically, K State would have had that information in variety performance tests. Unfortunately, recently, as of 2013, uh, we have not been collecting that information anymore. So we would not be able to offer that variety comparison on a yearly basis to producers. Perhaps we can find some information within the extension centers, uh, some of the trials that are still going on but that's just not offered on a yearly basis anymore. Mm -hmm. So really try to do the homework on, on trying to see what's the yield potential of that variety. Talking to the seed producers, perhaps they have some, some different comparisons or neighbors who have varieties that have been working well. So definitely that's one thing that we need to keep in mind, yield potential. Disease and insect resistance as well, probably traits to be looking at. Uh, when we talk about fall dormancy, Right, uh, we typically don't want anything to have a too high of a fall dormancy. Otherwise, our yields in the fall might already be compromised. We we might not produce as much fall forage because that dormancy might start early. Winter hardiness as well. Definitely, we don't need as much winter hardiness as states up north do. But definitely important to have good winter hardiness in our varieties, so it's going to make through the winter. Especially in the cases in the winter that we have, like this one. Mm -hmm. Right, it's right. been such a long winter. If producers are going to graze, perhaps some graze intolerance as well would be important trait to look at. And maybe a couple of new things that might be on the mind of producers uh, will be more on the either Roundup Ready side of things or low lignin alfalfa varieties. Since you brought those up for 
the first things you mentioned are pretty standard principles of alfalfa management and variety selection. But these two relatively new entries, the uh, glyphosate-tolerant or, if you rather, Roundup-ready alfalfa, what does that variety bring to the table, Romulo? So I guess producers would be familiar with uh, either soybean or corn Roundup ready, and it's essentially the same technology, right? So uh, we're looking at a strategy to make uh, weed control perhaps easier, right? So uh, that's the overall goal of this, uh, this alfalfa yield and adaptability. I mean, it really is going to be variety dependent. We shouldn't expect any yield drag from Roundup ready variety. Uh, in fact, there's some research showing that uh, I can perhaps at, at times yield even more than conventional varieties because some herbicides typically applied in alfalfa can can reduce a little bit the yield on conventional varieties. For example, imazamox or imazetapir are two commonly used herbicides that have been shown to slightly perhaps reduce the yields on those uh, conventional varieties. And in cases also perhaps damage following crop, right? So uh, from the weed control perspective, I think there's, there are several advantages there. A uh, wider time window, right, for an effective weed control. And in general, Roundup would control kind of a wider range of weeds than most of the other alfalfa herbicides. Mm-hmm. So those are some advantages of the Roundup Ready alfalfa. Now, we need to keep in mind as well that that comes with a cost. All right. And that cost could be disadvantageous. Sure. That cost can be the cost direct to that alfalfa crop as far as seed costs and royalty costs as well. Uh, there were some estimates from uh, UNL actually saying that this trade costs about $2.5, so $2.5 per pound of seed, right? So typically a, a bag of seed might be $50 or, or $70 more expensive if it's around Roundup Ready, and then you have to pay royalties as well. So have those two costs, right? The seed costs and the royalty costs. The cost can also come in the cropping system, right? So producers who grow corn or soybeans and that they are seeing the development of resistant weeds in those crops, they will also be resistant in an alfalfa crop. So if you're already having problems with uh, glyphosate-resistant weeds, then perhaps that's not the best option to choose. And maybe finally, uh, there are many producers that actually mix uh, grass with alfalfa. So alfalfa grass mixtures or even planting oats with the alfalfa as well. And, if well, you, you could do that with uh, Roundup Ready alfalfa, but you couldn't then spray it Roundup. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you'd kill the grass as well. So really, the advantages of it come on the form of a, perhaps an easier weed control, but it does come with some issues that the producers need to consider, which is the increased seed cost and also weed resistance. A producer, if they're going to seriously look at this option, just for starters, needs to look back at the recent weed issues, the history in their alfalfa stands, and if, in fact, this would be an advisable way to go, if their weed problem is that serious. Definitely. So I think the system can be very advantageous for producers whose weed problem are serious, but once you put Roundup Resistant in the mix, right. then then perhaps there are better options. So keep that particular point high on your uh, radar there as far as considering that alfalfa variety. Now, the low lignin alfalfa, this gets at the content of the alfalfa itself. And Explain what the specialty is concerning this variety. Sure. So, so here recently, 2014, 2015, there has been a development and release of some low lignin alfalfa. So first, let's think of what lignin is, right? right? And, and lignin, it's a plant structure, right, that provides strength, provides a structure to the plant. It allows the, the water to be transported within the plant without leakage. And so overall, it's a structure, right? So a plant with, with less lignin, it will have a lower fiber content, right? That's essentially what lignin does. And lignin is actually a good thing, right? It provides plant structure. It, it also, once that residue goes back to the soil, helps increase organic matter in that soil. So it's actually, it's a compound that we need in our plants. Now, the issue is that lignin is undigestible, right? Animals cannot digest that. And so it it reduces the fiber digestibility. Uh, That's essentially what lignin is. Now, when you talk about low lignin alfalfa, we essentially have uh, two types. Either those that were conventionally bred, to be uh, low lignin, so using conventional breeding methods, and they are not considered GMOs, 
those will be uh, the ones that come to mind now, Alpharex, known as high-gest varieties. Typically, these, they would have 7% to 10% less lignin than a conventional variety. And there's also from Forge Genetics International, which we call Harvextra. And now these ones, they are GMOs, right? They were genetically modified to downregulate the synthesis of lignin on those plants. And then we're talking about 15 to 20% less lignin. It's uh, substantially less lignin than conventional varieties. So uh, essentially what we're having is we're having less, essentially less fiber, right? A little bit less of that undigestible structure in the plant. So what are some of the advantages that perhaps a low lignin alfalfa has as compared to, to a conventional one? So by having this le- uh, less fiber, it will have an improved forage quality. Mm-hmm. So if we're going to cut at the same day when you're cutting your conventional variety, it should have an improved quality. Now, maybe where the biggest advantage lies is that you have a wider harvest window, right? So if at that one day when you would be cutting your, so for example, 10% bloom, uh, when you would be cutting your, uh, your conventional variety, you can actually wait, right? Perhaps uh, 8 or even 10 days. You, can, you could wait. If you have 20% less lignin, you can wait as much as 10 days after that. And so you'd harvest a higher yield, perhaps with the same quality that you would have harvested a conventional one 10 days earlier. Hmm. So, so you actually would end up increasing your yield. So there's been quite a bit of comparisons between uh, low lignin and conventional alfalfa as far as yield goes. If they're harvested in the same date, there's essentially no yield difference. Uh, there's about, I mean, if you have an adapted variety, it should result in very similar yields. So low lignin alfalfa productivity right in step with that of conventional varieties. But you say, Romulo, that there's an inherent advantage to the low lignin types in the actual cutting interval. If we might, we'll take that up after this break. Our guest is K-State agronomist Romulo Lolato talking alfalfa planting management with us. And we'll be back with more from Romulo in a few moments here on Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Agriculture Today continues now back with us, K-State Crop Production Specialist Romulo Lolato, as we're discussing seeding a new alfalfa stand this spring, if the weather ever decides to cooperate. Ahead of the break, Romulo shared with us helpful information on the new alfalfa varieties available to you growers, the glyphosate-resistant types and the low-lignin alfalfa. And uh, to round out our look at the latter, Romulo, you tell us that with the low-lignin types, growers can actually scale back on their cuttings without sacrificing overall tonnage. Yes, Eric. The biggest advantage is actually that in the season, you can reduce the number of cuttings. Right, so if you're uh, extending the interval between cuttings from uh, 32 days to to close to 40 days, 42 days, uh, right, you're delaying eight to 10 days, still ha- maintaining the same quality, then you're reducing the number of cuttings and increasing your yield in the season. So there's actually some comparisons that have been done with uh, either three versus four cuttings in the season, right? Considering stopping the season September 1st. Many times in Kansas, we can go a little bit further than that. Mm -hmm. But this data that was comparing three versus four cuts, right? And what they they were finding is that with those three cuts that you were leaving them uh, about eight to 10 days more, the intervals between the cuts, uh, you were increasing yields 20 to 25%. So actually, by reducing the number of cuts, the total season yield, so I'm I'm talking about the total in the end of the season, was actually higher. So if you're able to to wait, but your quality is still going to be the same, right? that's that's where the biggest advantage of these low lignin varieties lie. It's really perhaps reducing the number of cuttings. You have less costs with that. In each cutting, you're harvesting more. And then in the season, you're actually, at least data that... uh, 
pre preliminary data has shown up to 20 or 25 percent season gain in forage from reducing the number of cuttings. So far, it's all positive. Are there any downsides to the low lignin alfalfas? Well, uh, there's been some, uh, if we think of the function of the lignin, right, which is a structure, there's been some, some talks about potentially lodging issues, right? So although really in research, we haven't necessarily seen an increase in lodging. Perhaps on a field level, in a commercial setting, there might be. But really, uh, within a research setting, we, we haven't really seen much increase in lodging. So overall, I think the trait is really is really promising. I think if producers can get around the fact that one less cut might actually bring more yield in the end, I think the, the technology is, is quite promising. So something to ponder, the low lignin alfalfa varieties as well. Let's talk a moment, if we might, Romulo, then, about fertility management for a new alfalfa stand. As we know, it is a legume, fixes its own nitrogen. That's not where one focuses their attention. Sure, Eric. Whenever we're talking about fertility management on alfalfa, we need to remember that this is a crop that we are harvesting four, perhaps five times in the season, in the year. So the, the nutrient removal is quite, quite high. Mm-hmm. Right, we're actually, for every ton of alfalfa produced, right, the nutrient that is needed the most is potash, so K2O, right? Uh, we're removing about 60 pounds of K2O per ton of alfalfa. So it's a, it's a very high nutrient removal. We're also removing quite a bit of nitrogen, but as you mentioned, it's a nitrogen-fixing legume, so we don't really need to provide that. It removes quite a bit of calcium as well, phosphorus, and sulfur. So those are probably the ones that we probably should keep in mind now. So having in mind that nitrogen is going to be produced by alfalfa, and we don't need to really talk about that, let's focus on some of these other nutrients Mm -hmm. that, especially if you're going to establish this alfalfa stand now in the spring, you need to be on top of before getting into. First and perhaps foremost here is soil pH. So alfalfa is extremely uh, susceptible to acid soils. Mm -hmm. Very different from wheat that you get may get by on a, on a soil pH of 4.4, 4.5. Alfalfa, we need that soil pH higher than 6.5. So we're, we're talking uh, 6.5 pH or higher to really allow the alfalfa to, first to allow the bacteria and alfalfa together to produce that nitrogen, but also to maximize forage yield for alfalfa. And we need to correct that soil pH before going into the alfalfa stand. So again, remember, it's a four, six-year investment that we're going to have. So we definitely need to have those soil samples taken and the lime applied with enough time for it to be effective before we actually plant the alfalfa. Mm-hmm. And that's going to provide the calcium that, as I was mentioning, every ton of alfalfa can remove as much as 30 units, 30 pounds of calcium per acre. K2O, also, so, so potash, very, very important to supply potash because uh, it's a crop that removes considerable amount of potash. And for us to talk about potash management, you really need to look at the soil levels, right? Just like we're talking about soil pH, we need to look at soil levels for potash as well. Many of Kansas soil have already naturally high levels of potassium on them. But really, if you're talking about soil potassium levels lower than maybe 100 parts per million, 120 parts per million, that uh, there's an indicative that we need to, to supply potassium. Now, can I apply that with the seed? So definitely when we're talking potassium, the answer is no. Potassium is a salt, and as a salt, if we apply it with the seed, we can cause some, some seedling death, really, and, and have a reduced stand. So ideally, we would just broadcast potassium and um, potash in, in, in our, well, just broadcast it, and it, would, it should be incorporated with, with the rainfall. So really, it's, a, it's an easy application there, but definitely not with the seed. And you would, you would not till it in? You'd let the rainfall carry that, it in? Yes, that, that would work. You, you don't need to till it in. If you're going to apply calcium and pot, potash at the same time, then yes, you need to, you need to incorporate it so, that, uh, so the lime is effective at depth because lime is going to be immobile in the soil. Potassium is going to be mobile in the soil. So, so even in an established stand of alfalfa, it's effective to just broadcast potash sometime in the fall or, or early spring. Another nutrient that is that is needed for alfalfa production is phosphorus, right? So um, alfalfa is quite responsive to phosphorus. Now, phosphorus can be applied in furrow, and actually it's, that's when we see most of the response to, to the phosphorus is applied in furrow. 
So again, just like potash, you need to know your soil levels. Typically, if you're below about 25, 30 ppm, there will be a need to apply phosphorus to the crop. The most effective way is to apply in furrow. Again, always making sure that if you're going to apply a source of phosphorus that also has either nitrogen or potash, in furrow, you don't want that the units of nitrogen and potassium together are more than 10 pounds per acre, right? So that's that's uh, as much as we want to go. So just put enough phosphorus, making sure that the cumulative units of nitrogen and potassium that we're putting are less than 10 Otherwise, Bounce. you might burn your stand, in effect. Exactly. It will burn those seedlings. Broadcast phosphorus, if you're broadcasting before planting, uh, ideally you'd incorporate it, just like the lime as well. Now, there's there has been some research showing that even just broadcast phosphorus in alfalfa has had some good response, probably because the roots are relatively a lot of the roots are actually relatively close to the soil surface. Mm-hmm. So there's been some research, older research, than a case state showing that it was uh, it was actually an effective way to put out phosphorus, although my preferred way would be in furrow or broadcast incorporated. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned there are some other minor elements like sulfur. They need some attention. They're not the major considerations here, but uh, they need to be accounted for. Yes. So uh, actually, I mean, sulfur, I think it, it deserves still quite a bit of attention, especially because we have been seeing an increase in sulfur deficiency generally in Kansas, not only on alfalfa, but I'm more specifically talking about wheat fields showing quite a bit of sulfur deficiency. And that's mainly a function of the decreasing levels of sulfur being put down in the rainfall in the atmosphere. So really, uh, sulfur management, alfalfa will require maybe 8, perhaps 10 pounds of sulfur per ton of alfalfa produced per acre. So keeping that in mind, it's also a nutrient that, a macronutrient, a nutrient that requires, that is required in in relatively high amounts. So I'll definitely rather be on the safe side and perhaps being as mobile nutrient as it is, you can just broadcast gypsum or depending on the source, I mean, I probably, if you're you're putting elemental sulfur, it's not going to be available in the first year. You need to have that, that in mind. But I'll definitely be on the safe side and perhaps applying 20 pounds of sulfur to make sure that that's not a limiting factor because alfalfa yields can be very limited by lack of sulfur in the soil. The starting point, as always, would be a pre-plant soil test, and that will help you draw a roadmap for your fertility management for your alfalfa, the new stand. Definitely. I think, uh, Eric, any time they were talking about fertility management in crops, that's our starting point. We definitely, especially if we're talking about a, a kind of like perennial crop like we're talking in alfalfa here that will be there for several years. Uh, we need to know what we have in the soil so we can actually manage the crop. You bet. Well, from there, we'll come back to the cutting management for alfalfa, which we're not even close to yet, of course, Romulo. But uh, we need to lend some thoughts to that at some point, which we will do later on this spring. But for the here and now, this is information on variety selection, on fertility management is a good starting point for you producers to consider establishing that stand in good order this spring. And we'll have you back again soon, Romulo. Thank you for coming by. Thank you, Eric. Romolo Lulato is a crop production specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Producers, you can inquire about other alfalfa management information through your local extension office or go online to the K-State Agronomy website. And we'll have more after these moments away on Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Britton Rucker. Pregnancy diagnosis can often be tricky in beef cattle operations, but there is some alternative methods to pregnancy detection to help producers be more precise when evaluating their herd. With me now discussing alternative methods of pregnancy diagnosis in beef cattle is K-State beef specialist Sandy Johnson. Sandy, why is it important for accurate pregnancy diagnosis? 
Well, first of all, it's important for some pregnancy diagnosis just from the standpoint of it costs us $700, $800 a year to feed a cow year-round. If she's not going to bring a calf home to us, that's pretty expensive. And so we need to identify those females that are not going to be productive. And obviously, we want to do that accurately. And the cost of selling a pregnant cow as an open is also an expensive one. And sometimes that happens depending on when we preg check and we can't determine yet that she's pregnant. So we can learn some things about timing, but we really want to avoid feeding cows that aren't going to bring a calf home. What are some methods for diagnosing pregnancies that a producer can choose from? Well, there's um, essentially three different categories we'd look at. The the long-term standard would be rectal palpation, and and we're feeling the fetal membranes and trying to identify the fetus and perhaps the cotyledons. More recently, ultrasound has become more widely available. Cost of that technology has come down, and that is also another very effective method. And in that case, we can visualize the fetus, cotyledons. We can even do fetal sexing if we're at the appropriate stage of gestation when we check those. And of course, the nice thing about ultrasound is if we're working together, you can see if, if I know what I'm talking about when you see that fetal heartbeat or whatever we're looking at. Now, more recently then, we've come to some various chemical pregnancy detection methods. And there's been some on the market over the years that haven't quite panned out. They have not been accurate in every way that we need them. But right now, there is one test, pregnancy-associated glycoproteins. That actually is a whole family of proteins, and there are several companies then making tests looking for those various glycoproteins that we can use to diagnose pregnancy. And you discussed earlier palpation and ultrasounds are pretty typical. How well do these work? Well, in a skilled individual that also knows their limitations, they work very well. As we have our shorter gestation length, the risk of error tends to go up, and part of that risk is because we can have embryonic loss. And it takes more skill to identify a shorter-term pregnancy, and, you know, depending on if you're talking cows or heifers, you know, I might be able to pick up a 30-day pregnancy easier in a yearling heifer than I might a mature cow just because of the smaller change for that short-term pregnancy that would be more noticeable in that yearling heifer. But generally, a good palpator will have a sense of what they're comfortable with, and usually that has to do with what exposure they've had to a range of pregnancy lengths. And and that's one of the challenges of of training people is you can't always provide them, you know, here's the full gamut. You can see these all in one day to help them learn that. So that's a challenge in our, our training, but it's a reality in the field is what do you get reps in and what are you experienced in? You discussed earlier there's new methods that producers can consider. Do you want to go into that? Sure. Probably the newest method then is the blood testing, uh, the pregnancy-associated glycoproteins. Right now, there's three different commercial tests on the market, and they all use, you know, there's 20-some proteins. Each each of those companies uh, use a different protein marker, and so they have slightly different requirements in terms of how long since they've calved that you would are able to do the test, as well as how far along in pregnancy before we want to first see if they're pregnant or not but very accurate, very effective. I guess cost-wise can be very comparable to the other methods, but all of those, when we start talking costs, there's lots of uh, size and other factors that really determine how those costs compare. So what the producers can do is, if they don't already know how to take a blood sample, step number one would be to, to learn that, but, you know, relatively simple procedure that you can learn and they simply would need to get the supplies to collect the blood. And then depending on, I always want to tell them to follow the shipping instructions of whatever company testing facility they're using, but you essentially you know, collect that sample, package it up, and send it in. And usually in a couple of days, they're probably at this point going to email you back those results. So it's not like she's in the shoot right now, but the same token... It gives a lot of people more freedom to do that test on, on their schedule to learn that information. Do you see this taking off with 
your common cow-calf producers? Well, it really depends on the size of their operation and, and what they're trying to, to learn, all those factors into what that cost looks like. And what we do know is that, you know, based on what's coming through our veterinary diagnostic lab, we see an upward trend in, in people using that, which, which we would expect is a, a newer technology and haven't checked with other labs. But my guess is that, that they are seeing a, a greater use of that. It just provides another tool for producers. Pregnancy diagnosis isn't a one-size-fits-all thing, but it's another tool for us to use. And you know, we know that there's a lot of producers that don't get any pregnancy diagnosis done or their method is, let's see if she calves, which is really a, an expensive method of determining whether or not she's going to calve. And regardless of the method, like you said, how important is it for cow-calf producers to conduct some sort of formal pregnancy diagnosis? Yeah, the whole idea that you want to feed open cows during the winter. I've talked to a lot of people in the last few days about a, being short, we need a lot of energy to get through this cold weather. Did you really want to spend it on an open cow? And the other thing is we have a lot of producers that are using information about early pregnancies to manage cows. If I know these cows are pregnant in the first 30 days, well, I can sort and manage those differently. I might, if I'm giving any type of vaccinations prior to calving, well, I can stage those much better if I've got cows within a 30-day window as opposed to a 120-day window, and we know that we're trying to hit certain points in colostrum production with our vaccinations. Well, that's powerful stuff, and, and people don't think about a lot of those other management advantage of, you know, having that information. And, and in our industry, information is power, and I encourage producers to capture some of that by, you know, not only is she pregnant, but when is she pregnant? Well, Sandy, it seems producers have a lot of options to choose from in hopefully increasing correctly diagnosing pregnancy. That was K-State Beef Cattle Specialist Sandy Johnson. I'm Britton Rucker, and we'll be back with more after this break. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day -day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services, exploring options, generating solutions. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. I do not have the curriculum of the different agriculture degrees on hand. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. I've said it before as I came across the saying, and I quote, It takes a lifetime to know a farm. What we're talking about here are all aspects of the farm, not only the land, but also farm habitat. Of course, there is the soil with all of its nuances from wet to dry, south or north slope, and soil texture, and more. Then there is the grassland with all its variation, upland, lowland. There's native grass and the cultivated grasses like brome or fescue and alfalfa not a grass. There may be creeks running through the farm, natural woodlots, or like I did on acres of lowland, planted to walnuts. There's habitat and wildlife. With that and so much more, one can see that it takes a lifetime to know the land and all that comes with it as a farm. I'm not saying it cannot be done, but I pity the man or woman who wants to become a farmer and did not grow up on a farm where by osmosis one learned outside the covers of a textbook or lectures in a classroom. I'm not saying that serious study of subject matter feeding, soil basics, veterinary science, and so much more is not important. And before I forget, I'll mention agriculture economics. I do not have the curriculum of the different agriculture degrees on hand. I 
can call them up on my computer. But that's not the point I want to make. It takes a lifetime to know the farm, the land on which or where the farm is located. A lifetime. I think it also takes the input of the older generation to help one to become a good farmer. I think it takes a long time of intimately working with the generation or generations before to become the good farmer to be trusted with the land. For quite a while now, there has been a movement to show and share with city people, young people, what a farm is and what happens on a farm. The petting zoo is only a small example. The booklet, Old MacDonald Has a Farm, and the song, helps children to see or think about the old farm. But right now, I'm not so much looking at the farm in all its diversity, but I'm looking at the farmer. What does he or she have to know to run the farm successfully? I don't think there is any profession as challenging as that of a farmer. Maybe a general practitioner who's a family doctor, He or she, too, has to constantly think as patients come through. Think and know. Yes, there are the specialists, and they are also there for the farmer. But sometimes being specialists, they are too far removed of the complexity of a farm, as they have specialized on solving or proving one issue or problem. When the time comes that the young farmer starts to take over, I hope he or she has learned from his or her dad and granddad. Because if they have survived, there's wisdom and know-how which may not be in books. For me, a simple example is that no one learns to ride a horse by reading about it. Reading can lead to better riding and understanding of the horse. The same goes for other animals. How come an experienced farmer got killed by his young dairy bull? We all make mistakes, but there must be time to learn. And I'm sorry, a four-year college degree does not make one a farmer. What it can do is stress responsibility for the land and for all the living creatures. That includes wildlife. On my desk lays the book, The Care of the Earth, A History of Husbandry, by Russell and Kate Lord. I love the word husbandry. We were taught husbandry at the Hawkesbury Agriculture College, Richmond, New South Wales, Australia. Somewhere in the old stable plaza is a brick with my name on it. I feel honored. My son had that brick placed. I later purchased another brick with my college friend's name on it, and had it placed. Hawkesbury College, now part of the Sydney University, gave us a fantastic agriculture education. I graduated May 23, 57. I will forever be grateful for that education. Theory and practice, hands-on, but know why and explain. When I happened to glance at Freem's book, Elements of Agriculture, 1951, I happened to come across an old nutrition test for producing dairy cows. I grinned and carefully placed it back in the book. I think young farmers need all the encouragement and help they can get. It doesn't take much to lose what has been in the family for generations. When I think farming... I do not think just the land. We can ruin good land, and we have. The word erosion makes me shudder. But I have come to realize that the farmer is the key here. Does he or she feel their responsibility for their land, the lands which will be there for future generations? They themselves will be passing it on, just like granddad and dad did. But here is the kicker, as Wendell Berry has said. If a farmer fails to understand what health is, his farm becomes unhealthy. It produces unhealthy food, 
which damages the health of the community. Wendell Berry is talking of health of soil, health of crops, health of livestock, health of family, health of neighbors' farms, health of community, health. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. We appreciate you tuning in. Please rejoin us right here this same time tomorrow, won't you? Until then, and for Britton Rucker, Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.